Tonight's program on gratitude and addiction recovery will be presented by Dr. Amy Krenzman. Dr. Krenzman is an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota and an adjunct research investigator in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan Medical School. Dr. Krenzman's research focuses on factors that promote the initiation and maintenance of recovery from alcohol and other substance use disorders, particularly the mechanisms of therapeutic change that are precipitated by professional treatment, recovery community organizations, and 12-step programs. She is one of the few researchers who is studying the role of gratitude in addiction recovery. She also studies positive psychology, spirituality, 12-step programs, and sober living houses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Kretzman. Good evening. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for the invitation to join you, to travel uh, back to Michigan and, and join you this evening. So I do research on addiction recovery, and what that means is that I read rather widely in the field of gratitude, the psychological research on gratitude, um, and I also read uh, other research, uh, research on gratitude that other people have conducted in quite a bit of depth, oftentimes rereading and rereading key studies. And I also conduct my own research on um, gratitude as it pertains to addiction recovery. So um, based on that, what I put together in terms of this slide deck tonight is kind of a best of. What are some of the best ideas out there that I've found? Some of the most interesting ideas, some of the theories. And uh, what are the implications for people in recovery in terms of doing a gratitude practice? How, how can something like that be helpful in supporting and sustaining successful recovery? So tonight, uh, the talk will have three parts. Part one, an introduction to gratitude. Part two, an introduction to the history of gratitude. And part three, I'm going to present two of the research studies I've conducted on um, gratitude. We're also going to do some gratitude practices together with the pen and paper that you received when you came in. And so let's get started actually right away. And uh, the gratitude practices are going to be interdispersed throughout the talk. So we're going to start right away with a practice called the three good things exercise. I'll explain it to you. I want to give you some tips about this practice that we learned from our own research. And also then I'll give you some silence so you'll be able to write and think for a bit. So the basic instructions of this uh, gratitude exercise are as follows. Look back over the past 24 hours. Write down three good things that happened in the past 24 hours. And for each thing you write, write down what made that thing happen. So these instructions you see on the screen now are now um, on the right-hand side of the screen. And before I give you some silence, let me give you some tips because the key to this exercise is that small things count even things that felt good only for, for a moment or were only fleeting. And here are some tips for what you can think about uh, that would count for this exercise. If you enjoyed the weather, maybe you had a nice exchange with another person, um, maybe you achieved some small accomplishment, like you made it here tonight for the lecture. That's something you wanted to do, you planned to do, and you made it. Um, anything, any fun you had, anything that was fun any moment of kindness or encouragement that someone offered to you. Uh, maybe a good idea you had, an idea to solve a problem. Maybe you saw or heard something beautiful, or there was something you enjoyed. Maybe you heard some news that just made you feel relie relieved of some worry that you had. Or it could be absolutely anything else. So I'm going to give you just like about a minute and a half to be able to think, uh, to follow the instructions here on this side of the slide. Okay, now I realize that wasn't enough time, but maybe it was just enough time for you to get a taste of the exercise. And I just wondered if anyone would be willing to call out maybe one of their good things on, their pa on the page. Anyone willing to bravely let us know? Yes, breakfast with her husband and was a. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> breakfast that her husband made for her and having breakfast with her husband. Was that a. Any? Sunshine, we got some sunshine today. Oh, a plan among Al Anon friends to go to the movies. That sounds great. And one more. Hugs and kisses from two little girls today. That sounds great. Okay, thank you. We'll move forward now with the introduction to gratitude. 
And what I'm going to, um, the way I'll do this is with very, very brief quotes from the research. This is like the greatest hits, the best stuff I have found in the research. And um, as I introduce gratitude to you, we'll be t I'll be talking about definitions, forms, benefits, and theories. So gratitude has been associated with a pleasant state, a positive emotion. Um, it's known to be uh, something that feels good rather than something that feels bad. And that's uh, persistent throughout the literature. Gratitude is thought by many to be something that typically involves, when we benefit, from the costly, intentional, voluntary action of another person. So with this conception of gratitude, the idea is, and this is the language they use, is that there's a benefactor. There's someone who has been good to, to, to us, kind to us, has done something good for us, and that is when gratitude happens, is when someone has some, done something good to us or for us. And there's also this idea in the literature that gratitude is felt especially in response to a gift that cannot be repaid or a gift that is in some way unearned. That whatever it is you got, somehow you didn't do anything to deserve that. It was something that, that was just kind of like luck. Um, and because of this idea of gratitude happening as the result of something a benefactor has done, there's this idea that the emotion of gratitude motivates us to reciprocate, either to the person who's been good to us and we're good to them back, or to pay it forward and be good to some other person. So therefore, people have concluded that gratitude is an emotion that's essential to everyday relationships. So the evolutionary purpose of gratitude, the, 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 the purpose of gratitude in human life is that it, it it makes our social bonds with one another uh, tighter. There is another line of thinking in the psychological literature that says that gratitude doesn't need to have a benefactor. We could just be grateful for being here, grateful for the warm sunshine, grateful for another day of life, without necessarily tying that to, to a benefactor. And that's actually kind of a, the, uh, a topic that's debated in the field right now, with some people thinking, oh, there's got to be a a benefactor there, or it isn't gratitude. There are those who say that gratitude, whether you realize it or not, suggests a comparison to an alternative, less desirable state. So if you say, I'm grateful for this hot meal, without really knowing it, you're kind of also saying, I'm grateful that this isn't a cold meal, or I'm grateful that I'm not going hungry. So when you say, um, I am Someone might say, I'm grateful for being sober. What are they basically also saying at that same time? Glad I'm not drunk or glad I'm not active in my addiction. So it has that counterpoint um, uh, um, inside of it, whether you think of it or not. So I like to think of gratitude as taking on three major forms. And when you're looking at a research study or you're thinking about gratitude, it's important to know which form are you talking about. Gratitude practice, state gratitude, or trait gratitude. So a gratitude practice is systematically paying attention to what is going right. And I think of that as a behavior, something that you're actively doing. State gratitude is an emotion that attends an experience of thankfulness or appreciation. And I think of that as an emotion. That would be a more fleeting, momentary feeling of gratitude. Then there's something called trait gratitude, which is a life orientation toward being more susceptible to finding things to be grateful about in life. Someone who's very naturally um, noticing things to be grateful about um, in, as, they, as they move through the day. And I think of that as a, as a way of being. So it's kind of interesting to think of these three different ways of framing gratitude. The research literature really strongly shows that when people have high levels of trait gratitude, so when they very naturally feel gratitude for a wide range of different types of eliciting stimuli, um, then that high level of trait gratitude tends to co-occur with a lot of other good things for that person. And so we say that gratitude is then positively correlated with things like growing or benefiting from a negative event, which is also called post-traumatic growth when something negative happens, but you somehow use it and you, thr you somehow thrive, thrive from it. Um, and that's associated with gratitude. 
Gratitude is associated with positive mood and happiness. Coping with problems in helpful ways, including getting help from others or actively trying to solve the problem, what they call approach coping and gratitude are correlated. Among AA and NA members, length of recovery is correlated with trait, higher levels of trait gratitude. The longer someone is sober, the higher their uh, rate of uh, trait gratitude which actually um, makes me think of a very interesting question because I wonder if over time in a 12-step program, if a person becomes more grateful over time because of the topic of gratitude that's a fre frequently mentioned, having gratitude modeled for you, being asked to do a gratitude practice, I would say that um, a, a trait gratitude might be expect, uh, we might see that that would increase, even though traits usually don't change in a person. Also among AA and NA members, uh, high gratitude is correlated with social support from sponsor and friends in recovery, step work, and the AA promises coming true. And benefits of gratitude, uh, high levels of trait gratitude are also cor negatively correlated with some uh, unpleasant kinds of things, such as psychopathology and substance abuse, coping with problems in ways that are less helpful, including denial, self-blame, withdrawing and giving up, envy, materialism, worry, frustration, anger and fear, negative emotions, burnout and other measures of employee uh, 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 well-being, and among AA and NA members, stress and physical health symptoms are ne what we would call negatively correlated with, with trait gratitude. So you might conclude that increases in gratitude will lead to positive benefits. So you might ask yourself, whenever there's a correlational study, which one really came first? Is it because the person is happy that they felt gratitude or has all kinds of good things happening in their life that they subsequently felt gratitude? Or if you cultivate a, a feeling or a way of being around gratitude, will that precipitate good, other good things flowing from that uh, way of being? And therefore, you might think that, well, a gratitude practice would give me more moments of state gratitude, and maybe over time, your trait gratitude would increase and lead to other, other positive, positive benefits, including the potential for making life in recovery more pleasant, more positively reinforcing, and therefore more resistant to relapse. So the next section is about theories, theories of how gratitude may work. Uh, in recovery or for, for anyone. So uh, here are three of my ideas. Gratitude may work in recovery by improving a person's mood. It may help interrupt a pattern of negative thinking. If you know the brain science behind uh, what happens with addiction and what happens in early recovery, you know that for people in er early recovery, it can be difficult to feel positive emotion in response to everyday ordinary stimuli. Um, and the brain can also produce a lot of extra stress and anxiety in early recovery. So there can be a preponderance of stress and kind of low levels of positive feeling in early recovery. So maybe uh, a gratitude exercise could help introduce some, some uh, positive emotion during this very important time for positive emotion uh, to, to come on the scene for people. Gratitude can also reinforce the idea that uh, life in recovery is better than life when actively uh, using. And that can reinforce recovery and encourage someone to be sober for another day. Here's another theory of how gratitude works. Um, uh, the negativity bias. The negativity bias says that negative thoughts, emotions, and experiences have greater impact on us than neutral or positive experiences. So if something really, really good happens to you, you'll feel good for a while, and then it'll become the new normal. So you can think about a time when you got your dream job, or you met your significant other, you fell in love, or you bought your house, or you found that apartment that you love, uh, or some good thing happened for you, and how good you felt then, but then after a while, it just fell into the background, and it was just regular and you stopped thinking about it. Maybe even it started to aggravate you a little bit. <laughs> so the negativity bias serves an evolutionary purpose, and that is uh, that if there's going to be a physical threat to my well-being, to my life, then I have to pay, pay attention to it. 
And so that's why negative things are more strident, they're more striking, they're more memorable, they stay with us longer than positive or neutral things. You may know the researcher Gottman, who does all the marriage research, and he says, he has found in his lab, that it takes five positive events to neutralize one negative event in a marriage or in a relationship, and that's the negativity bias in play. So gratitude may help us to tip that balance a little bit and to play up those positive things that happen that, um, that, that may fall, would normally fall into the background as part of human, human behavior. Another theory that explains gratitude is the theory of the hedonic treadmill. This theory says that we eventually return to a stable level of happiness despite positive or negative events. Again, this idea of um, returning, to, uh, returning to a baseline level and things falling into the background. Uh, and again, improvements in life provide short-term happiness and then we become accustomed to them. There's also a theory of the maintenance of behavior change. And this theory says that initiating behavior change is a different psychological process than maintaining behavior change. And arguably it's harder because many, many more people start uh, uh, an exercise program or they start recovery or they start a change in their food plan, uh, the way that they eat. But fewer people sustain that over time and arguably recovery needs to be sustained or would optimally be sustained all the days for the, of the rest of the person's life. So we're talking about long-term maintenance of significant change and that, that is a hard task. So this theory says that individuals who are maintaining a behavior change regularly, whether they realize it or not, they're asking themselves, is this worth it? And is my life better now that I've made the change? And that answer needs to be yes in order for that person to continue to leverage the considerable resources and motivation that they need to sustain that change. So this theory says that whether people realize it or not, there's always a comparison being made between now and then. Um, so we're going to move on now to our um, next exercise, which is the gratitude list. And uh, who here has ever before in their lives done a gratitude list? Okay. So I'm going to uh, offer you some things that might help you think of it in new ways, possibly. So there's an app that I use that I like a lot called Insight Timer. This is the, this is the little logo of that app that you could look for. And um, it has all these um, guided meditations on the app. And one of them is this guy, Jonathan Lehman. And here's what he says about where he touches on this idea of gratitude. He quotes Albert Einstein. It's actually unclear whether Albert Einstein ever really said this. But for our purposes, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. So what Jonathan says is, um, see, see everything today as a miracle. The colors our eyes will see the sounds our ears will hear, the tastes our palates will feel, the new and old faces we will encounter. What he's encouraging here is being grateful for things we usually take for granted. I want to offer you one other way to approach a gratitude list uh, for your consideration. Here was Bill Wilson, co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Here was his approach to a gratitude exercise. This is from As Bill Sees It. He writes, one exercise that I practice is to try for a full inventory of my blessings and then for a right acceptance of the many gifts that are mine, both temporal of this earl world of earthly and spiritual. Here I try to achieve a state of joyful gratitude. Now let me break this down into three steps, not steps as in the 12 steps, capital T, capital S, but steps as in lowercase s, three steps that I'm going to interpret out of this statement. The first is to take a full inventory of all blessings. And what I add to this is the idea, look back all throughout your whole life. What, uh, what are all the blessings you have um, that have been yours all throughout your life? And to write them all down on paper. 
Second, once you've gotten that all, on, all written down, to take a look at it and just uh, uh, take some time accepting the reality that those blessings are yours. That's really your truth. That really happened for you, those good things. And they really are yours. So it's kind of like letting that soak in. And then finally, to be present to any positive emotion that follows. So with this guideline on the, um, on the slide, I'm going to give you another couple of minutes to try this exercise. And again, I've not given you enough time to finish. Um, but uh, if you'd care to, uh, take a moment now and look down on your list and affirm these gifts are mine. As Wilson said, uh, acceptance of the many gifts that are mine, a right, a right acceptance. And at this point, I, I invite anyone who wishes to do, is there anything on that list that you would like to uh, say out to the group? Any one item? Yes. Oh, wow. Kids, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Yes. Al-Anon. Yes. Resilience. Yes. Great quality. Yes. Sunrises. Your recovery. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's awesome. A loving golden retriever. Long-lasting, um, Yes. When I tried it this way, that's what came up to me, are my lifelong friendships, those friendships that go all the way back, you know, like, uh, that is great. Only a couple of <laughs> Yes. Right, right. It's nice to uh, appreciate those, to not let those fall into the background. Yes. Growing up in a family with a lot of hugs and kisses. Sounds good. Yes. Awesome, right? That is a great perspective, that your problems are smaller than they once were. Just having any good memories, having good memories of the past, at least some good memories of the past, yes. You, you look back and you say, well, it, it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did everyone hear that? Sober nine months today and pregnant with her first baby. The other thing that came up with for me when I um, did this exercise in this way are all the educational experiences I've had. Like I've been to some good schools, I've gotten lucky uh, with some really good programs, and so uh, after you know that, those things uh, continue to be on my gratitude list moving moving forward. We're going to shift now into uh, part two, which is the history of gratitude. Now I'm not a historian; that'll become clear very rapidly, <laughs> but I do have uh, some history to tell you to put gratitude and research on gratitude into perspective. So gratitude has an ancient presence in human life, and that's mostly through the world religions. All of the major world religions uh, have the, a very strong theme of gratitude, mostly uh, the idea of gratitude toward God. And, um, but this, this theme permeates texts, teachings, and prayers. So it's a very, very old idea. And also, um, philosophers such as Aristotle uh, wrote about the nature of gratitude in human life and found gratitude to be a virtue. In other words, uh, gratitude is a good, positive human quality. So we, we're going to speed forward about 5,000 years of human history or more to uh, gratitude in 12-step programs. <laughs> so tell me when AA was founded, what year? 1935, and the big book was published when? 39, and the 12 and 12? Okay, about I hear 54. So in those early writings, you might be surprised to find, to learn, that gratitude is not mentioned very often. This might surprise you because of the prevalence of the theme of gratitude in 12-step programs. But if you go, as I did, to aa.org, and you, you can search inside the big book electronically. And if you search for G-R-A-T, it'll deliver all occurrences of words with that, uh, those four letters in it, all occurrences of grateful and gratitude. And if you search for thank, it'll return all occasions of thank and thankfulness. And you'll find very few occasions. Here are... Um, Really, there's maybe one or two other occasions, but here are the main occasions that you find. Uh, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better from into action. His sanity returned, and he thanked God in a vision for you. And that's basically it, except for in the stories. There's maybe three examples in the stories where the word gratitude uh, comes up. 
If you do that same search, was there a comment? And if you do that same search in the 12 and 12 text, which you can do again through aa.org, you find very few occasions of gratitude. Here's the main one in step 10, that when, you, when we do a 10th step inventory, uh, we, uh, we list an honest regret for harms done and a genuine gratitude for blessings received. So it's both sides of the ledger. And that's pr predominantly where this word appears in the, in the 12 steps uh, part of the 12 and 12. So you might be interested to uh, learn that it isn't until Wilson's, Bill Wilson's later writings where he really starts to write about gratitude. His uh, articles in the grapevine and, um, and gratitude as it appears in the text as Bill sees it, which I'll be talking a bit about uh, more uh, shortly. Um, as you know, that text has it, as you may know, that text has an index with many, many different recovery-oriented terms, and there are 17 pages of the text indexed to gratitude. So that was 1967 uh, when Wilson was writing prolifically, including the topic of gratitude. So we're gonna speed forward uh, ahead. Uh, let's see, about, I don't know how many years, you can help me count, to the psychological research on gratitude. When was it that psychologists started to pay attention to gratitude as a psychological construct and start to do research on gratitude. Well, it pretty much started in 2001, 2003. Back in those years, um, the psychological papers that it started to talk about gratitude said, social scientists have tended to neglect gratitude as a topic uh, uh, and that the psychological research on gratitude is in its fledgling state. So in those years, um, they were only getting started. But there's been a lot of work since then, and in 2017, there was already enough intervention research where gra doing a gratitude practice was the intervention, and they would look at whether that had an effect on the people's well-being and happiness. There were 38 such studies, about 10% of them were dissertations, enough to have what's called a meta-analysis, which is a kind of scientific study where you take a whole batch of studies and you basically pluck one number from each study that represents the findings and you sort of average them together. That's not exactly right, but that's more or less what a meta-analysis is. So what they found from that study is that um, these were all studies that where one group of participants did a gratitude practice and the other group of participants did something else that was meant to be neutral and have no impact on them. So when you compared the two groups overall across 38 studies, the gratitude group had significantly more well-being, happiness, life satisfaction, positive mood, optimism, higher quality relationships, and less depression than the neutral control group. So that's like the summary across studies that you can get from a meta-analysis 2017. Now I want to um, point out to you, can you see this flashing uh, green light there? That represents the overlap between research on gratitude that relates to addiction recovery. And this is a teeny tiny area of research. This is the place where I do my research. So, um, you know, I see this as research on gratitude and addiction recovery. So here you have psychological res uh, research where they're trying to help people uh, do a gratitude <coughs> practice and see the impact. And here you have really a community of people who are living their lives uh, in, in, you know, with gratitude, with gratitude as a, uh, for many, a central part of the way that they live their lives and, and sustain their recovery. So the, the area of overlap is very small. The first study I found that addressed this in any way was 2010. And that was a small intervention for adolescents um, where gratitude was one part of a component of, of other kinds of things that were meant to be helpful and positive for them. So uh, that takes us through the history. We're gonna move now into research on gratitude. And I'm gonna present to you two of my studies from this very slim area of overlap. <coughs> so I don't know how many research presentations you have heard in the past. I just wanna give you an overview of what to look for and listen for when you hear a research presentation. You want the person telling you about the research study to tell you what was the main question that guided or drove the research. What did, what's the main thing they wanted to find out from the research 
uh, which is called the research question. You want the person to tell you about the data. What was the data or the information that they used that they analyzed to produce the results? Where did it come from? How did they get access to it? And how much of it was there? If it was research on human subjects, you're going to want to hear the person say, here's a demographic profile of um, the sample. Here's how old they were. Here's what race they were, how much education they had. Um, you're going to want to hear about the design of the re research study. How was it planned and organized? You want to hear the results. What was the answer to the research question? And you want to hear the researchers' ideas on the implications. So all right, you, you did this study. You found this result. What does that mean for people? What does it mean for people in recovery? What does it mean for future research? What does it mean for policy? Um, you want, you're going to want to hear that. And when you hear these things, it helps you evaluate, do I have confidence in the findings of this study? based on these kinds of pieces of information. So typically, when you hear a research uh, presentation, they hit, they hit all these marks for you. So um, a, a study I've only recently completed that I'm very excited to share with you, uh, only the second time I'm talking about it to an audience, is, um, was driven by the research question, what, was Bill Wilson's, what were Bill Wilson's ideas about gratitude in Alcoholics Anonymous? So for this study, this was a qualitative study, which means I studied words instead of studying numbers. Um, I used uh, the text I mentioned earlier, as Bill seeds it. How many are familiar with this text? OK. And I took all of those 17 pages of the text that were indexed to gratitude. And the words on those pages became my data that I analyzed. So uh, as Bill sees, it was published in 1967. It includes in its entirety uh, quotations from Bill Wilson's other writings. And uh, there's an index of topics. And very importantly, I discovered that Bill himself had um, oversight over what was selected and what was included in the book. The actual selections were made by a volunteer named Linda G, who was a copy editor in New York, worked on a lot of AA type materials and was on a lot of um, committees and so forth at the time. She made the initial selections, but it, uh, these selections got Bill's word-by-word -word approval. And they talk about this in the book Pass It On. So luckily, they captured that piece of history. So that means that what's indexed under gratitude, I argue, represents what Bill Wilson really thought about the idea of gratitude. And this is what the text looks like inside, open to a random page, just in case you haven't seen this uh, before. So each page stands on its own. It has a header and a couple of paragraphs. And it cites the, at the bottom, it cites the original sources where the words originally appeared. OK, as you know, 17 pages were indexed to gratitude. Each page contains between 91 and 164 words. The pages reference 25 original sources. That, the, the original sources were published between 39 and 66. And these are all the different um, original sources that um, were drawn from for those 17 gratitude pages. So next, I'd like to give you just a general introduction to qualitative research and how that works. Um, so qualitative research involves the deep study of things that are not numbers, such as words or images or observations. Um, and as you study in depth, um, you identify content that is both interesting and related to the research question. And you mark that content for um, its topic. You identify a topic to the content that you find. Then you'll notice that the things you found naturally start to cluster according to similar themes. Like you find similar content from page to page. And those things are, you can use an electronic piece of software to help capture those together in one, in one bucket that eventually becomes themes that you find. And you read and you reread and you reread the text to make sure that what you're finding is really matching what's on the pages. Then you make an interpretation. The researcher makes an interpretation about how the themes are connecting to one another. And then um, the researcher draws a picture of how the relationships connect. And the picture usually looks like a bunch of boxes 
with the themes written inside the boxes and a bunch of arrows showing how the themes connect to one another. So I'll be showing you the final uh, picture shortly. So here were the themes I found in those 17 pages indexed to gratitude and as Bill sees it. First, repeatedly Wilson says that the credit for re someone's recovery is not due to one's own self or his own self, uh, but is due to um, uh, God and to other people. So uh, Wilson really maps to this idea from the psychological research that there's this idea of a benefactor. And that's a very prominent theme in these pages. So uh, there's also a very prominent theme of humility, that it's not about anything that um, a person would congratulate themselves about. It's not about, quote, big shotism. It's a uh, uh, recovery and what follows from it, which is success in life, according to these data, uh, all flow from a higher power and the goodwill of other people. And this results in gifts and blessings that are enjoyed, most prominently featured on these pages, the gift of AA itself and the gift of recovery. And finally, there is that theme of paying back what we've been given, just like from the psychological research, research <coughs> that when we feel grateful, with it comes an urge to, um, to, to, be, to pay it forward or to pay it, to, to pay it back. And that was prominent on these pages as well. Also, under the theme of recovery from alcoholism, there seemed to be four themes that were prominent. One is that recovery is joyful. Wilson used very positive language when he talked about recovery. He talked about the release and joy that people feel. He talked about the joy and satisfaction of uh, being living, able to live life well and help other people with recovery. He talked a lot about how recovery is communal and the deep love and affinity people have for one another in recovery. This was a prominent theme um, in these pages and gratitude toward, toward one another. Also in these pages is the prominent theme that AAs, uh, people in AA, after they get sober, they become successful in life. Um, for, for example, AAs should expect to begin to achieve some measure of importance and material success and reclaim the esteem of our friends and business associates. But again, even these good things that follow from recovery, according to what's on these pages, are not things that um, a person would congratulate themselves about or kind of get an inflated ego about or become arrogant over because they flow from recovery, which flows from a miracle, from, from something divine, something from, from God. Also in, on these pages are the theme that people in AA have what I'm, I'm using the word efficacy, that is an ability to do things to make life in recovery even better. And Wilson, uh, so individuals in recovery are not just passive recipients of the grace of God and the goodwill of others, but they're empowered, empowered in several ways. They're able to bring about feelings of happiness by way of using gratitude to, to elicit positive emotion they're able to find positive things even in negative circumstances. And they are able to use gratitude on purpose to promote a feeling of humility and diminish a feeling of arrogance or um, uh, self-importance. So these are things that can be done on purpose and intentionally that people, people have the ability to do. So now I will um, uh, raise the curtain, the red velvet curtain up and I will show you the picture I drew that explains the 17 pages. And so um, basically, credit for recovery and subsequent success in life is not due to oneself, but to ex external benefactors. And I'm again using the psychological word benefactor here. Wilson doesn't use that word. God and other people. And as a result of these gifts and blessings, such as the AA program and recovery, which is joyful, communal, successful, and efficacious, um, there's a feeling of paying back, and the pages talk about paying back uh, our gr gratitude toward God with a willingness to find and do God's will, and paying back other people, not necessarily by paying them back, but by carrying the message to still others. Now, the word used in these 17 pages is God. Consistently, there's, there is not mention in these pages of a, high, uh, a higher power uh, or God as we understand him. Those words are not in these pages. 
So the next thing to think about is how could these findings be helpful for future research? How could they be helpful for people in recovery? How could they be helpful for, how could these results be helpful for clinicians? And this is really something I, I open up and ask you what you think about it. I mean, there's a couple things I see in it. One is that gratitude can be used on purpose to, um, to feel positive emotion and to feel a feeling of humility. Um, uh, there's a strong theme of social support or the rela relationships with other human beings and feeling gratitude for those connections. And there's a strong theme of gratitude toward a higher power or, or, or more broadly, maybe a strong theme of spirituality. That's what I see in it and I just wonder, anyone else see anything else in it, implications for any other areas you can think of that over time in recovery there's a sense that, that, we, that, that people become more, more grateful, more naturally grateful people over time. Yes. There was, and also in I, the idea here, uh, I put it under efficacious that if something bad happens and he talks about um, you know, the, the ravages of addiction, that something good comes out of that, you know, that recovery comes out of that. So the idea that even when there's a bad circumstance, that there's, a, there's something that positive that can come from it. Any other thoughts? I think it's very interesting. So traits are meant to be hardwired and we're not, men, made, we're not meant to change those traits. They stay as they are throughout a lifetime. Um, now the research on gratitude is mixed. So if they do a gratitude intervention where people are asked to practice uh, gratitude for some number of days, and then they look at whether they became, their trait gratitude increased. Some of the studies show a slight increase and some show no, no difference. But I think the studies are too short in duration, that only two weeks of a gratitude practice might not have someone change their level of trait gratitude. But uh, five years in recovery or 10 years in recovery or 15 years in recovery, uh, then maybe you see that, uh, uh, I think we would see it if we could, I, I believe that we would see it, a cha an increase in trade gratitude, yes. Yeah, it's like much more than just doing the uh, three good things exercise every day. It's kind of surround sound. So, um, you know, what are the implications for this study for people in recovery that gratitude improves mood, that gratitude reduces self-centeredness or promotes humility, gratitude can be employed on purpose for positive benefit Helping others might be connected to feeling grateful for, uh, for recovery. So uh, we'll move now into another study I conducted. Um, this study was a study of gratitude in treatment for alcohol use disorders. And my research question was, what would people in treatment think about doing a gratitude practice? Would they uh, be into it? Would they not like it? Would it be agreeable to them? Would it be acceptable to them to even do it? And how would, gratitu would a gratitude intervention impact their, their mood? So this is a study I conducted in an outpatient substance use disorder treatment program. I recruited people who had alcohol use disorders and I randomized the people into two groups. One group did the three good things exercise that we started out with tonight every day for 14 days. And the comparison group had other questions to answer. I'll show you what those were in a moment. Um, the nature of the sample overall, they were 23 outpatients, um, average of 46 years old, average of 16 years of education, about half female, mostly Caucasian, about half were married. They overall had high levels of AA attendance low levels of depression, anxiety, alcohol craving, and drinking consequences. It, it was a sample who not, it wasn't like a sample of people going into treatment, it was a sample of people already who were in treatment, so they were already starting to feel some relief. And a wide range of days since last drink, ranging from weeks to years. So the gratitude group did the three good things exercise that we started with. Every day they were sent a link in their email, they clicked the link, and into the computer they typed three good things that happened and why they happened. Now the control group or the comparison group, we made up questions that we hoped would have no impact on their mood because mood was our major um, outcome. So we asked them about things related to what's called sleep hygiene. Things like how much caffeine did they consume in a day? 
when they slept or napped, was the TV on at the same time or were lights on? What did they do when they first woke up? What did they do when they first fell asleep? We asked these folks to answer these questions every day for 14 days. So while the, this group was doing gratitude, these guys were doing this. So our primary results had to do with the effect on mood. Well, first of all, we, we did some qualitative research to see, uh, exit interviews to see how did people like it? What did they feel about it? Was it okay with them? Were they willing to do it? And at very high levels, uh, our research participants filled out these questionnaires day, day after day. So there was a high level of uh, participation, which indicates that people were all right with doing it. Um, but our main outcomes had to do with mood. So we tested mood, we measured mood three different ways. We wondered if the gratitude exercise would have an impact on what's called activated positive affect. Those are things like feeling active, enthusiastic, determined, strong, or inspired. Sort of things that are like a very um, energetic, energetic varieties of positive mood. Separately, we measured something called unactivated positive affect. These are the quieter, more subtle versions of positive mood, like feeling calm, at ease, and relaxed. And then for negative affect, we lumped it all together with just a bunch of negative uh, uh, moods over here, scared, afraid, upset, distressed, or nervous. So we were able to look at the impact of gratitude on each of these, different, th these three different types of mood. So I just ask you, what do you think the results were? Who thinks that the gratitude exercise resulted in an increase in positive affect, activated positive affect clap? If you think it went up, or raise your hand. Clap or raise your hand. Okay, all right. How about unactivated positive affect? How about reductions in negative affect? Okay. What we found is that there uh, was a significant increase in unactivated positive affect, feeling calm and at ease and relaxed from doing the three good things exercise every day for 14 days and decreases in negative affect, but no change in uh, these more stimulating or activated uh, dimensions of positive affect. And this is what it looked like. So here's the 14 days of the study. These are projected uh, change lines, trend lines over the course of all the participants. Green is the gratitude group, and this is negative affect going down for the gratitude group and kind of more or less flat for the control group. This is the same uh, 14 days of the study on the X. On the Y is unactivated positive affect, feeling calm and serene, our gratitude group going up. It looks like our, our uh, comparison group is going down. That might have been because they were starting to get annoyed with, um, <laughs> they, they realized they sh what was going on with them, because we interviewed them at the end of the study too. They thought they were in the treatment group, by the way. They didn't realize they were in the control group. But they thought that um, they realized their sleep needed to change and their uh, caffeine needed to change, but they weren't making any changes, so they're starting to feel a little aggravated, and maybe that's why they were a bit, maybe a bit less serene. So also in these qualitative exit interviews, we got to talk to people about what it was like for them to practice that exercise over time, and we got a quote from someone that represented what several people said. Uh, I always felt that I was falling back on, well, because I'm in recovery. That was pretty much the answer every time. When we asked them, um, why did that good thing happen? So for that person, every time he looked at a good thing, he associated with, well, it's because I'm in recovery. You know, why is that good thing in my life? Well, because I'm in recovery. So for that person or anyone thinks like that, the, the, the exercise is gonna reinforce recovery because you're always gonna say, well, that good thing is here because of recovery. It's gonna keep it front and center rather than that idea we talked about, about it falling back into the background. So uh, ideas of, about this study that you know, have implications for people in recovery, one is that small things count. So when you're doing a three good things exercise or a gratitude practice, that small things really count big. You don't have to wait for some really big um, thing to happen to count it on a gratitude uh, practice. Uh, so thinking of three good things that happen each day might increase feelings of calm, ease, and peacefulness. And connecting good things in life to recovery can reinforce recovery. I can also tell you we followed up with these individuals um, about 12 weeks after the study ended. And um, 
Only one person in the gratitude group was still writing down the three good things exercise. Everyone else had stopped. They said, sometimes I think of it, I bring it to mind, but only one person was still writing it down. And the positive mood benefits were no longer apparent. So it was only when they were doing it daily that, that they got the, the mood benefit. When they stopped, it didn't continue. The mood benefit didn't continue. So this also suggests the idea of making some kind of regular uh, practice of it. So uh, with that, I am going to give you my overall grand conclusion um, to my talk this evening. And then we'll be able to take some questions and maybe have some discussion. Um, so for me, uh, what I draw from all of this, first of all, is a pervasive theme that gratitude, um, secondary to gratitude practices, is associated with improvement in mood. I see that uh, uh, everywhere. But my overall conclusion is, Gratitude helps make life in recovery better, and gratitude helps foster the idea that life in recovery is better. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> so we had a Brene Brown question, Gaber Mate question, and um, I know those folks a little bit, and I haven't really sat down and saved or thought about, you know, how does it connect to gratitude? So I, I need some time to think about it sometimes before I can uh, answer it. But I like what they both have to say. I can say that much. Um, so let's take some questions, and I um, uh, can share some other things with you as well. But you make a very good point. That was a small sample size. So remember the very tiny sliver of green that's in between the gratitude and the recovery. The state of the research literature now on gratitude and addiction recovery is very small samples, small pilot studies. So um, anything that's found is uh, interesting and encourages future research with bigger samples and uh, results that need to be replicated um, uh, with other, um, in other labs. So it was a small sample size of only 11 people in each group. Yes. Well, first of all, the first thing I was was really grateful that I measured two kinds of positive affect because we found um, something interesting there that was significant in one and not in the other. Um, so it's an excellent question. Would a different kind of coaching or a different kind of gratitude practice make people more like enthusiastic and excited and stimulated? Um, uh, so it's a, it's a good question. I haven't given it thought. When you hear a research study, you should uh, hear the person talk about limitations. So um, limitations of the first study, uh, would you like me to talk to those now? OK. The first study is, um, is uh, one where it was a single researcher, it was me. So um, anything that I um, found in the data was through my own filter, my own uh, ability of interpretation of words. So someone else uh, might uh, come up with a different conceptual framework if they were using their own, their own research self as a filter. In the second study, um, a small sample size was one uh, limitation. Another was that it was primarily Caucasian people who had pretty high socioeconomic status, very highly educated. So you wonder whether that would be true if you surveyed other types of people. Nope. So the question here is, or the comment, is that there was a reading that um, Resentment comes from suffering that, that a person felt was undeserved. So what's with this theme of undeserved? You know, that uh, gratitude is something that a person didn't deserve. Um, so I don't have an answer on the top of my head for that one. You know, some of these things get pretty philosophical, and I feel I just have to think and ponder. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts about that, this idea that a resentment is undeserved suffering. But here's this theme of undeserved again in the gratitude <laughs> literature. I don't know. Yeah, and those are fascinating questions you're raising, that <coughs> gratefulness and recovery are slow to, uh, uh, gratefulness is slow to occur in recovery. It takes time. So an important question is, how long were the people sober in this research study? And it varied. It varied a lot. Some were just a few weeks, and some were um, a long, longer time, uh, many years. So a good question that you're raising is, um, what was how the effect? Was so for some people, it might be, um, uh, uh, it only takes one positive thing to uh, d dispel a negative, and for others, it may take um, uh, many, many, you know, it might be m even more extreme than five to one. So um, it was probably some kind of average or some kind of um, 
average that represented a range. And you, what you're suggesting is the person's own traits would have an impact on whether, how upset they are by a negative thing in a relationship and what it takes to resolve that for them. That would probably vary from person to person. I agree with you. I think it's a fascinating question because of the profound change that happens in recovery for many. Uh, and it has not been studied to my knowledge. So there has not been studies of how working the steps has an impact on someone's traits or someone's way, ways of being or the nature of change that happens with working the steps. I don't find any studies that have been done on that at all. Yes, the other psychological research that does not focus on um, addiction, they've done research on gratitude and, and depression. And they find that overall for positive psychology type interventions, things that improve someone's mood, that that's, uh, people get more uh, gains from those exercises if they're already starting out at some kind of deficit. So they have more, they have lo farther to go. They have more that they can gain from it because they're kind of starting out a little bit lower than average is what I've read. Dumber, double winners as in AA and Al-Anon? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great research question. I haven't seen anything on it. There's just starting now to be the first studies on Al-Anon. There's just a handful of them. Uh, so the double winner question I think would be happen in the future. I'm not aware that that is happening yet. It's an excellent question. It came up earlier uh, over dinner. Uh, the idea that what, what about uh, people with very long-term recovery? What research is there on people with long-term recovery? And I'm not aware that there, that there is any. I'm not aware of it. Um, the idea is that uh, someone was feeling gratitude for something they felt they didn't deserve and all their friends rallied around them and said, no, you did things to make that come about. And so, um, so maybe there's something in our culture that says, uh, no, we, we're individualistic. We should, we, should you know, we should take credit for things we've done, right? And I feel there's a, there is a role for that in wellness, right? Is recognizing what people have done for themselves uh, to improve themselves. Um, it, it, it's just a, in the psychological research on, on gratitude is that theme of not, not uh, feeling um, sometimes being grateful for things that people feel, felt they did not earn. And that was uh, prevalent in the, in the Bill, Wilson, Bill Wilson writings too, that it would be better to say, it's because of God that, uh, that the person is uh, in recovery. Whereas a person in recovery does a lot to help themselves go into recovery and stay in recovery. There is a lot that a person does that also has a role and needs to be affirmed also. Yes, so for her, she felt grateful related to a feeling that she didn't deserve it. And otherwise, it wasn't gratitude. It didn't feel like gratitude to her. And that might have been because of her own uh, ideas she'd been exposed to or um, uh, things that she, that she um, felt about, about herself and her role in, in her own life. No differences between men and women in the, in the gratitude study, the three good things study. Yes. That is a great hypothesis. So the idea here is maybe we don't see gratitude coming up in Wilson's writings until later because it had to mature for his, in his own recovery and his own development. And it was part of his more mature recovery. And then he started writing about it later on rather than earlier on. That's a really great idea. We're going to give that a snap. That gets a snap. That's a really cool idea. No, I don't do any uh, bio biochemical or biological research yet. I don't, do, I don't measure that stuff. What research on gratitude am I going to do next? Um, I'm going to pilot test a gratitude journal exercise that includes some different components. So on the left, uh, on a journal page, on the left-hand side of the page, the person would do both the three good things exercise and the gratitude list, because they actually get at different things. But also, I'm inspired by the 10th step, which suggests also look at what did not go well in the day as well. So look at both and journal that uh, as well. And on the right-hand side of the page, it's the idea of planning goals for the, for the next 24 hours. And to um, uh, implement this type of journaling among uh, women who are in residential treatment, getting ready to transition out and see what value they find in it, um, what, uh, what they find helpful about it. Again, when a, an intervention is new, you want to look at whether people would even be willing to do it and whether they find it agreeable, acceptable, um, whether they like it, uh, whether they get anything out of it, and that's the earliest stages of a new intervention study. So that's one thing 
uh, I'm going to be looking at. I also have some data um, uh, to look at differences between people who have alcohol use disorder, have alcoholism, uh, and have been, been in treatment. Um, but for those who return to drinking, look at uh, their levels of gratitude and um, how that affects change for them. And I have a preliminary study I didn't include because I felt there was already too much in this talk. But there was another study I did that showed that people with alcohol use disorder who had been to treatment but they returned to frequent but lower levels of, of uh, drinking, if they had um, uh, low levels of gratitude, that was associated with stopping drinking six months later. So for them it was low gratitude that was um, predictive of making a positive change in their drinking. If those folks, it's, hard, it's complicated to describe this, if those folks had high levels of, of gratitude, they didn't change their drinking six months later. Because if you think of it, if you're saying, I'm so grateful for everything that's going on, there are so many people I'm grateful for, you're basically saying everything is fine the way it is. And those people are not motivated to change. But if they're saying there's nothing I feel grateful for, there's no one I feel grateful for, I, everything is kind of lousy, those are people who are more motivated to change, and that's exactly what my data showed. Among people already sober, if they had higher gratitude, they were more likely to still be sober six months later. So there's some more um, analyses I can do to look at who were these drinkers who, um, they returned to drinking and they had this very interesting relationship with gratitude. Who are they? Um, a little bit more about their demographics and their addiction severity. But the question is, any effect of length of time in recovery on our results here with the gratitude intervention? And again, the same with gender. I must have looked at that, and um, uh, my memory is there, wa there was none. Uh, but I'd have to refresh my recollection with the details there. Other research, and thank you for reminding me about that research that shows that quality of life initially in recovery actually goes down before it starts going up. And maybe a gratitude exercise might be especially helpful then. It's a very good thought. In early recovery, the, the, one of the first things a person does is faces kind of like the wreckage of what just happened. So that can be kind of a bummer at the beginning. I so appreciate the chance to address you tonight. Thank you for your kind attention. Have a good night.